Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Developing a Proper Worldview. Uh, this here is actually going to be episode number 14. Um, so if by some random chance you just happen to be tuning in to this one um, and you haven't watched any of the previous ones, I highly recommend that you watch these in order um, because that's the whole intent and purpose of these videos is to try to help develop um, a correct biblical geopolitical worldview um, in a step-by-step -step foundational process. Um, so so I'm, I'm doing this in the, in the way that I learned uh, for the most part. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that this will help you learn as well. Um, so please try to watch these in order. Um, on my, my channel, you can just go to the playlist, uh, Developing a Proper Worldview, and you can watch them in order. Um, like I said, this one is number 14 in a very, very long, long series. Um, I'm guessing we'll probably have 200 videos by the time it's done, uh, Lord willing. Um, so uh, maybe, I, I don't know how this is gonna go, but I think I have enough material um, to do, you know, probably 200 videos or so, but um, it's extensive, it's fun. I enjoy doing these. Um, you know, it's it's uh, me just rehashing and going back over everything that I've previously learned, refreshing my memory, helping me uh, get excited about certain things, talk about certain things. I hope that, that you're learning and enjoying these as well. Uh, most importantly, that, that you learn to love and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and that you take his word seriously and that you understand that his word is rock solid truth that nothing stands in the way of it. it. It is the authority of all of life and, and nothing will ever contradict or, or compromise it. It will stand firm till the end of the age um, and perhaps even beyond. I, I don't know what it's gonna be like in heaven. I suppose we don't have need of the word then because we'll be with the word, Jesus Christ. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> um, right now we're, we're in our um, series on evolution. Uh, which is one of the the foundational steps I, I believe the gospel and 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 making sure um, your foundation is, is the first step making making sure that you're standing upon the rock that is Jesus Christ that you are born again that you know him you love him you believe his word and you're trying to see things through his eyes um, trying to understand you know what what his thoughts and what he sees about the world and and his determinant um, foreknowledge and counsel and how he has laid out the entire plan of the world um, which we get a, a general outline in the scriptures we get an idea and that that's what we're doing here um, so <clears throat> that needs to be your foundation and then I believe the second step of that is that he is the creator um, that his word is true because the biggest lie we run into in society is the theory of evolution. It stands um, opposed to a creator God, the creator God that's revealed in the Bible and says that everything is just mere random chance. Um, it contradicts the Bible on almost every level uh, from the age of the earth to um, the, the geologic column to radiometric dating to to um, bloodlines and, and races, which is a made up term. There's only one race. Um, so it, it's just contradictory to everything the Bible teaches and, and, and the fact that it's shoved in our face from the moment we're born, from the moment we can comprehend thoughts. We're taught millions of years ago and we're shown images of dinosaurs and we're told these things existed way before man and the earth is old. Um, so it's, it's just a blatant contradiction of the Bible. And so it needs to be addressed and, 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 and combated and overcome right at the beginning. So we lay that foundation of the gospel. We lay that foundation of Jesus Christ <clears throat> And knowing him and being born again and then our immediate next step is defeating the theory of evolution and showing that the Bible is to be trusted that, that the Bible is true that God created all things and so we've been looking at one of the greatest resources that I know of that is out there um, at least in in video format I, I mentioned a couple of books the collapse of evolution by Scott Hughes and uh, The Long War Against God by Dr. Henry Morris, a beautiful book that I just finished. Um, and then there's other resources out there too, Answers in Genesis, uh, AIG.org, I think. I never know if it's .org or .com, but it's Answers in Genesis, AIG. 
our uh, Creation Research Society, which is a uh, uh, CSR, uh, or, or the, and then I think there's a Creation Research Institute. I don't know if they're the same thing. CSI, CSR, uh, also CSR.org, CSI.org. I would assume. Um, not CSI.org. That that probably bring you to that TV show, but um, Creation Research. Uh, society, Dr. Henry Morris. Uh, so if you search that out, and then of course there's uh, Dr. Dino, <clears throat> and I'm sure there's other creation resources out there too that I'm unaware of. But um, as far as videos go, because a lot of this, I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of this scientific stuff can just go way over my head. Um, like I mentioned before, I tried to read an article about starlight and 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 star distance and, and light years and. It was so heavy and so complex, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I thank God that there's people out there that do that work, that, that put in that work and show that the Bible's true and nothing contradicts it. Um, but some of it's just way too complex for me. And some of the teachings um, are often, you know, spoken on a, on a highly intellectual level. Um, collegiate, you know, it, it's almost like you have to be in the field of biology or in the field of archaeology to understand some of these things but so I appreciate it when a scientist when somebody with knowledge um, dumbs it down so to speak so that I can understand it and we've been watching these creation seminar series uh, by Dr. Kent Hovind and he does that he explains this on a level that uh, like I think everybody at a fifth grade and beyond should be able to comprehend as a matter of fact I recommend every single Christian parent um, require their children if, if you homeschool which you should be um, this should be part of your curriculum you should be teaching your kids this because you want them to understand the dangers of evolution you want them to understand that that this theory exists out there so that when they run into it in the future they're not overwhelmed and overcome because it seems so logical and it seems so wise and everybody seems to buy into it and then the faith is destroyed because they go oh is everything I was taught in the Bible false is everything untrue so you want them to understand what the evolutionary theory is you want them to understand its strong points and then you want to show them how the Bible conquers it at every every front uh, that there's nothing to be afraid of the Bible is true and that the, the same thing applies with cults no matter how wise or, or, or logical or reasonable uh, you run into with like Mormons or Catholicism or Jehovah Witnesses the scriptures are true the scriptures will overcome every argument put your faith in the Bible the Bible is true every man a liar um, it stands true against every argument. It shatters every argument. It conquers every argument. The Bible wins. Uh, when when clever atheists and skeptics bring to you and say, "Oh, there's contradictions," no, the King James Bible is it rules over them all. So uh, stand firm on that. But <clears throat> um, on the theory of evolution, here we're going through these series of DVDs. And uh, we're, we're getting solid information and easy, easily understood information that we can, that anybody can grasp onto. And you can have these bullets, so to speak, in, in your ammunition pocket. You, you know, you can have these to use when you're confronted with theories of evolution. You, you can have these, these teachings and these ideas, these, these reasonable, logical, um, intellectual arguments uh, that are simplified and explained and, and just completely make sense. And um, so we've got these. We watched the first two. We're just starting the third video now, or the third third DVD. And uh, this one is on dinosaurs in the Bible. So uh, I appreciate you guys watching with me. Without further ado, let's jump into it. All right, so here it is, uh, disc number three, uh, dinosaurs in the Bible. Let, let's get started. You know, for many years, the existence of dinosaur fossils was thought to be a problem for creationists and for the biblical account of creation. Hi, my name is Eric, and what you're about to see is a powerful seminar that combines the last 30 years of research done by Dr. Hopin. It's in a field called cryptozoology, which is the study of hidden animals. The seminar is titled Dinosaurs and the Bible. Before even started starting in this um, dinosaurs are in the Bible it talks about Leviathan and behemoth um, it, the word dinosaur was invented in the 1800s um, so th the Bible was written well before that so you can't expect that word to be used dinosaurs prior to the 1800s were simply known as dragons or Leviathan or behemoth 
Um, so they are mentioned, it's just having a different name. Same thing with like unicorns. People say, oh, the Bible talks about unicorns. It can't be true. You're, you're telling me there were flying horses with a, with a big rainbow colored horn? No, that's a modern invention that you gave the word unicorn. That's something that you invented. The word unicorn previous to your invention just meant one horn. Uni meaning one, corn meaning horn, unicorn. Uh, just meant a one-horned creature like a like a rhin rhinoceros or a rhinosaur I never know how to say it. is it rhinosaurus or rhinoceros Whatever the case that's what's being referred to in the scriptures when it talks about a unicorn um, All right, so just with that as a preface and I, I believe mr. Uh, Hoven will touch on that as well, so to our third uh, videotape, our session on dinosaurs and the Bible. And we'll just refresh for the folks that haven't been here yet. This is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. We live in Pensacola, Florida. We have three kids, all married, and the dog died. I made it. I'm home free. It's wonderful. And all three of my kids work for me, and two grandkids, and more coming all the time. This fellow in National Pornographic, a geographic, I mean, says, <clears throat> no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Well now, hold on just a minute. Does he know that or does he think that? He thinks that. There's no way anybody can know that unless they talk to everybody that ever lived. Did he talk to you before he wrote that? Did he talk to Adam and Eve before he wrote that? I doubt it. He says nobody's ever seen Well, he might believe that, but that's not part of science, folks. The Bible says in the beginning, God. Think about that as we've watched these videos. Um, think about how often the textbooks state things as fact that aren't fact. That's intentional to, to brainwash children. It's a common argument. You hear oh, everybody believes. Or just for instance, the other day I heard uh, Dr. Fauci um, trying to justify um, these masks or lockdowns or, or whatever the case he was arguing with uh, Senator Rand Paul, and uh, he said to Senator Rand Paul, uh, like, you're the only one that believes this. That's kind of arrogant. Like, no, he's not. You know, the statement that he was making uh, is actually believed by a lot of people. And so, like, there's that arrogance in it. Like, this is the truth. You know, we, we believe, I believe this, so therefore it is the truth, and we're going to proclaim it as such. Like, when it's not, uh, you know, scientifically proven, it's not a fact. It is a theory, but they proclaim these things as if they're fact. They state them like they're fact. Um, I was just watching Hoven debate some somebody, and the, and the guy argued, well, you know, if we don't say that, what are we going to say? We, we have to say something. I'm sorry, so, so you're going to lie to children just because you feel like you have to, wouldn't it, you say, hey, we don't know. We, we assume nobody saw dinosaurs. But there's a uh, there's a vast majority of people out there that would say otherwise that would that believe in 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 creation that believe in the Bible that would say dinosaurs existed with man, but of course they're not going to do that because they want to discredit God they want to discredit the scriptures and they want to promote their idea as if it's fact. Uh, they want people to think that when it's just a theory, and it's a nonsense theory as we've been seeing. It's a lie. It's an intentional lie. God created the heaven and the earth. And the Bible says pretty clearly in Exodus 20, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What do you suppose he meant by that? He wrote that on a rock with his finger. That's part of the Ten Commandments. It looks to me like he's trying to tell us that he made it all in six days. Which means Adam must have seen dinosaurs. The Bible says there was no death till Adam sinned. Your textbook says dinosaurs died before man got here. Somebody is seriously wrong. And we're going to discuss today who it is. And in the last session, we talked about how what the Garden of Eden was like. The Bible says when God made the world, he said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. There used to be a layer of water above the atmosphere. Some people think it was ice. I don't know if it's solid liquid or gas. I don't know. Water comes in three flavors. But somehow there was water up there. How it was up there, I don't know. The Bible says it was, and I believe that. I think there are some reasonable theories of how it might have been up there. It could have been ice suspended by the magnetic field of the earth. That's one theory. But the Bible says there was water above the firmament. Also, the Bible says most of the water that's now in the oceans used to be under the crust of the earth. If you read Psalm 24, it says the earth is the Lord's, 
He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 136, he stretched out the earth above the waters. Most of the water that's now on the surface, oceans, used to be in the crust. Big subterranean water chambers. I think when Adam and Eve were here, the world was mostly land and a small percentage of water. Today, 70% water and mostly land. And even that land that we have is only 3% habitable for mankind. That's crazy. 3% of the world's surface is habitable for mankind. Most of it's ice caps, deserts, under underwater. God designed it to be inhabited. What we see today is a junkyard compared to what Adam and Eve saw. Hmm. So there was water under the crust of the earth. That water that's under, that used to be under the crust came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. Man, that's crazy. So, Just a side thought here. There's seven and a half, eight billion people on the earth, and we all fit in 3%. That's mind-blowing. How big is the earth, man? That's crazy. Man. And there's plenty of room. That overpopulation nonsense. You know, it's ridiculous. In the creation, up until the flood, things were very different. During that time, everything lived over 900 years. You could learn a lot in 900 years. Did you know that Adam spoke every language in the world? There's only one, but he spoke it, okay? Now, reptiles never stop growing. It's just a simple biological fact. Reptiles grow all their life. People stop growing. When you're 16 or 18, you're going to quit growing, at least uh, vertically. Some go horizontally afterwards, but reptiles never stop growing. And what would happen to a reptile if you put him in the Garden of Eden and let him live to be 900 years old? You'd have a big lizard. A really big lizard. Dinosaurs were giant reptiles that lived with Adam and Eve before the flood. They did not live millions of years ago. They were pre-flood, not prehistoric. So if this is all true, did Noah take dinosaurs on the ark? They asked Billy Graham, were there dinosaurs on Noah's ark? He said, no, apparently not. Noah's ark did not include dinosaurs because they were extinct before man got here. Oh, Billy, now you got death before sin. I love Billy Graham, praise God for the good he's done, but folks, he's wrong about that one. Dinosaurs on the ark. Man, I hope, hope he kept the woodpeckers in a steel cage of some kind. Some people say, what do you mean dinosaurs on the ark? They're kind of big, aren't they? Well, the big ones were big, but the little ones were little. And Noah was 600 years old when he built that boat. I just bet he was smart enough to figure out you don't have to bring the biggest ones you can find. Bring two babies. Right. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. That'll be important later. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons for bringing babies on the ark. You bring babies because they're smaller. Uh, duh. You know, the biggest dinosaur egg ever found is smaller than a football. You bring babies because they weigh less. They eat less. They sleep a lot more. They're tougher. You know, kids fall down and bounce and get up and keep running. Adults fall down and break or lay there for a while. Mm -hmm. Plus, you bring babies because after the flood, they're going to live longer to produce more offspring, and that's why you're bringing them. So it makes common sense to bring babies. Why would you bring big elephants on the ark? Why bring big giraffes? Bring babies. Hello. Plus, you only had to bring two of every sort, not two of every single variety, just two of the basic kinds of animals. He said in Genesis 7, bring them after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. I mean, the Bible's pretty clear. It was the basic kinds of animals, and only those in whose nostrils was the breath of life. And only those on dry land. Noah did not have to bring any fish on the ark. They had plenty of water outside. He also didn't have to bring any bugs on the ark, because bugs don't have nostrils. They breathe through their skin, through spiracles. Hey, bugs can survive a flood just fine. On floating log mats or floating dead carcasses or something, or burrow in the mud. Go any place where there's been a flood. After the water runs off, walk out into the mud and tell me the first thing you notice. Bugs by the gazillions, right? Noah brought two of the basic kinds of animals on the ark. Noah probably never saw a chihuahua in his life. He just brought generic dogs, like our dog, Nicky. We had Nicky for 12 years before we even knew what kind he was. A friend of mine came to my house one day and said, oh, hey, brother, oh, you got a canard lick. I said, a what? He said, your dog, that's a canard lick. I said, really? He said, yeah, look at it. You can already tell what kind of dog it is. 
How many of you have a full-blooded canard at home? There we go. <laughs> so just generic animals. This Mexican textbook says the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I agree. And it looked like a horse. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard equipment. You know, it was a horse kind of animal. So the basic kinds that were on the ark, not every species. Skeptics will say, how did he fit those millions of animals on that little bitty boat? Well, no, hold on just a minute. He only brought the land animals, okay? Bring those with nostrils, no bugs. Bring babies, that's common sense. Bring two of each kind, not every single species or variety. Just so you know how, you, how they identify kinds, I think uh, it's because the scriptures say they can produce. So if, if two animals can produce offspring, they're the same kind. A zebra and a horse or a donkey and a, and a, and a mule and, and all that, they're all the same kind. Uh, how many were there? Many experts will tell you there are about 8,000 basic kinds of animals in the world. Just basic kinds of animals. I talk pretty fast. I can get going 300 words a minute when I get excited. But did you know if you just talk 60 words per minute, you, you can, can name all 8,000 animals in a little over two hours. Some people say, Adam couldn't name all the animals in one day. Are you kidding? You can name them in about an hour. Dog kind, cat kind, hippo kind, giraffe kind, elephant kind. <laughs> Plus, Adam had an IQ of who knows what. I mean, he came pre-programmed straight from the hand of God. He could walk, talk, name the animals, and get married all first day. <laughs> really smart God, okay? Plus, uh, how big was the ark? The atheists will say, he couldn't put those animals on the ark. And I say, really, how many were there? They say, we don't know. Oh, well, how big was the ark? They'll say, well, we don't know. All we know is he couldn't do it. <laughs> oh, I see. Is that the way this works? Yeah. Well, beats what they believe. They believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, nothing exploded in the Big Bang and made everything. Mm -hmm. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down and a rocky surface was created. Yes, boys and girls, the planet Earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. This is what the textbooks teach. Teach and as like form, fact. It was like the moon. It's nonsense. It was hot. And there were None of this is known. Lava. It's their idea. But slowly, rocks absorb the oxygen. It's never been seen. No, this textbook says never the percentage been observed. of oxygen was zero, but the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> I wondered about that when I said, it's a college textbook. Yeah, there was nothing there, but they absorbed it all right. So the rocks absorbed the oxygen, and then it began to rain on the rocks. Oh, man, oceans formed as it rained for millions of years. Millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans was a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Where the chemicals Progress from complex from? chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Well, I guess it is. It's totally stopped. Doesn't even happen. That's how slow it is. This book says the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So their theory says 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down. It rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And that first life form found somebody to marry. Now there's a good trick. <laughs> and something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. They asked me to speak at this college in Boston one time. They said, you can speak to our students if our professors can ask you any questions they want. Because we'd like to show the students how dumb you Christians really are. I said, I would be honored to come for that. <laughs> so I got, I got, <laughs> I got, I got there and there were six professors and all their students in the room. I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, you know. I said, folks, I got my charts out here, and I said, I believe the Bible. The Bible says God made everything 6,000 years ago, 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood, you know, destroyed the world. Noah saved two of each kind, not every species, just the basic kinds on the ark. Now, since then, there's been a lot, whole lot of varieties produced, you know, big dogs, little dogs, curly hair, straight hair, no question, but just basic kinds on the ark. And then I told them what they believe, because most of them don't know what they believe. you got to tell them. You guys believe 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. One professor was getting kind of upset about that time. He said, Hoban, you realize there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world? I said, yes, sir, there's a bunch. He said, you mean to tell me that all those dogs came from only two dogs on Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. 
He didn't have any more questions after that. I was in a debate one time, and afterwards this lady came up to me, and she said, she was obviously upset. She said, tonight, you said that we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, ma'am, just calm down. You're about to blow a gasket, you know. I said, ma'am, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, okay, then tell me, where did we come from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, and where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. It was so cool. You could see it was slowly dawning on her. You know, I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? Yes, ma'am, you certainly do. Yeah. I found her life verse saying to a stock, or my father to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. There's Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Yep. I found my daddy's life verse. Lord have mercy on my son, free as a lunatic and sore bed. Anyway, the Bible says the earth was filled with violence. Everybody was wicked. All flesh had corrupted his way. Everything was corrupt. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark. And so Noah said to his boys, boys, go for wood. we got to build a boat. And so he went and got all this wood, and he built this big boat. Now, after the flood was over, Noah's son had a son, and named him Arphaxad. So regarding the size, he mentioned it. On, I don't know if he, I think he gets in. He's got to get into it. But uh, the size of the ark was like um, four and a half stories tall, we think, based on a cubit. A cubit is the measurement from your elbow um, to the tip of your finger. So a cubit varies uh, based on like national, like the Jews' cubit would have been shorter than an Egyptian's cubit. An angel's cubit, who knows how big that is. Um, so we don't know how big the cubit was that was measured, but let's just say it's a foot and a half. Um, that would mean that the ark was four and a half stories tall and um, 50 yards wide, I think, like the size of a football field, and then um, 450 yards long. So um, that's, what is that? That's four and a half football fields long. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. 450 yards. Um, huge. Um, you can go in Kentucky. Uh, Answers in Genesis has a museum. They built a replica of the Ark. A huge museum. It's the, 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 the size of what they think the Ark is based on that 18-inch cubit. Um, the Ark Museum in Kentucky. I can't remember what city in Kentucky, but um, very cool. I think every Christian should go there at least once. It's a very, very cool place cool museum uh they actually have two museums there's the ark museum and then they have the creation museum which is like a few miles away so it's two separate locations two separate buildings um i would recommend spending two days uh take a day at each to enjoy it like you bring the kids to the, to it because they got all sorts of kids games and stuff go in the spring or the summer because there's a lot of outdoor activities i went in like late fall early winter um so i didn't get to do the outdoor stuff but uh, it was still very cool and, and worth seeing. Um, I highly recommend that you go there and check that out. Why would anybody name a kid Arfax Can't you see that kid in kindergarten? What's your name, son? Arfax Head? You know how to spell it? Yeah, no? Yeah, that's a good one. Arfax Head? Nobody does. Don't you think one day? Little our facts is getting big enough. He's sitting on Grandpa's lap like kids do, and he looks around. He says, hey, Grandpa, I have a question. How come we're the only people in the whole world? Where is everybody? <laughs> Eventually, that thought's going to cross his mind. And Grandpa's going to tell him a story about the flood. Actually, his daddy's going to live long enough to tell that story to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's crazy. That timeline, when you think about time. it. Look at that. Shem, who was on Noah's Ark lived till the time of Joseph. That's insane. I mean, there there would have been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people around the world by then. But like, they could have talked to Shem. Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, they could have directly spoke to Shem, uh, probably Ham and Japheth. I don't know why they're not on the list. This is following one specific family line, but that's crazy to think about that these, the they lived long enough to speak like Noah uh, 
almost would have been, I forget, like I've seen the timeline before, Adam lived long enough to, to be able to talk to Noah's grandpa, I think. So, like, I think, I think Methuselah, I think he was alive when Adam was alive or when Seth or somebody. But you can you can look at the different timelines. It's crazy. Like, they could have, the, the entire world, you know, at the time of Noah, there's probably just billions of people. Uh, time of Noah's grandpa, same thing. They could have all went and visited Grandpa Adam. You know, they could have got the, the story directly from Adam's mouth. And then the same here. Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham could have got the, the story of the flood from Shem. That's that's crazy. Not story. I don't like to use the word story. Story implies fantasy or, or like, you know, we read books and we call them a story. It's not. A, it's a historical account. I'm back there, folks, right, right after the flood. flood. And, and today, today there are 270 surviving flood legends. legends. They're still telling the story about the flood. In, In many cultures, cultures that have never heard of the Bible. Bible. You, you know, know the, the Hawaiians uh, had a legend that, that said, the first, after, after long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a... This is key. This is one of those keys that you can lock on to. Um, for a testimony if the flood didn't really happen wasn't worldwide how do all of these cultures have the same basic mythology for their history how do they all just happen to come up with the same story it has to be rooted in some sort of truth all these cultures all across the world never having contact with each other <clears throat> all telling basically the same story so that's key to lock onto the same thing with dinosaurs just so happens that all these different cultures happen to have all these myths about dragons where they they describe the creature just like a dinosaur in china and the the vikings in the in in, in the norwegian uh countries just happen to have the same stories come on it's based in truth and then over time you know they they add their own little mythology to it they forget the the real story and just start uh exaggerating it Quick and terrible place, place to live. live. There, there was, was one good man left, his name was Nulu. He, he made a great, great canoe with a house on it, filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nulu and his family were saved. Hmm. Interesting. One family saved in a giant canoe. That sounds kind of like the Bible story, doesn't it? The Chinese have a story called the Hiking Classic. It's one of the oldest stories in the world. It says the father of their civilization is a guy named Fu Hai. The story says Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. After the flood, they were the only people alive on earth. And they repopulated the world. Well, now that sounds kind of like the Bible story too, doesn't it? The Tolkien Indians in Mexico have a legend that says, The first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a flood that covered the highest mountains. Only one family named Cox Cox survived. 1,716 years. Well, you know, the Bible dates add up to 1656. But that's not bad for a legend 4,000 years old. I just suspect maybe even the Atlantis story is another flood legend. As far as the people on the ark were concerned, the whole world sank beneath the waves, you know. Why would there be 270 surviving flood legends today? Oh, well, I think it's because there was a flood. That's my theory. <laughs> it's not too complicated. If, if you, you look, look at the country, country of Turkey, Turkey, on the far right hand side, there's a mountain called Mount Ararat. On a Turkish map, this is called Noah on Gumshi, which means Noah's big boat. They've got signs to drive right up to it. This way to Noah's big boat, five kilometers. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month. Now that's interesting. Some of the skeptics will say, no, the flood lasted a year. The flood didn't last a year. Noah was in the ark for a year. But parts, parts of the ground probably only underwater for a few weeks or a few months, months just long enough to ground everybody. The ark actually, actually hit the bottom in the seventh month. month. Now, why, why did he get out until the thirteenth month? month? Uh, we'll cover all that on video number six, all the reasons why he stayed in the ark. But the Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month upon the mountains, a plural, mountains of Ararat. The Bible does not say the ark landed on Mount Ararat. It could have, I don't know, but it doesn't say that. There are at least four theories of what happened to Noah's ark. Some, Some people, people says, say, say they, they took it apart and used the lumber for buildings. After all, when Noah got off the ark, how big were the trees outside? About this big, right? Pretty tough to build a house out of. Some, Some people say it rotted, it fell apart, it's gone. Could be. Some people say it's still on the mountain. And they're always going over there looking for it. They always come back and say, well, we just almost found it. We'll try again next year. And it could be, I don't know. Other people think it's not even on the mountain, it's down in the valley. 
Those who think it's on the mountain go over there looking for it. They always say, could be here, could be here, could be here. They're always looking for it. And I'm not against that at all, but I just am telling you, there's no absolute scientific proof that it's even on the mountain. Other folks think it's not even there. They think it's down in the valley because the chances of something landing on a mountain as the mountains are rising or the water's running off, chances are close to zero. Try it in a bathtub. Bring something up under a floating object. It'll float off to the side. It's more likely to land in what's called a nested area between a bunch of mountains and the water can slowly drain off. Many people think that the 1960 photograph showed a boat-shaped object that could have been Noah's Ark. As they examined it in 1978, an earthquake lifted it out of the ground or the ground fell away, whatever happened. It's now sticking up out of the ground about 10 feet or 15 feet. They think that's Noah's Ark right there, that boat-shaped object. I've had people tell me that's not Noah's Ark because when mud flows around an object, it makes a teardrop shape. Well, I understand that. I talk physics on how that works. The front end of an airplane wing is rounded, the back end is pointed. But this one's facing backwards. There are two more teardrop shapes like that, but the round end is uphill. On this one, the pointed end is uphill. This is not a mud flow. Many folks think that's Noah's Ark. I knew Ron Wyatt. He died in 99. He was a good friend of mine. We differed on quite a few little things, but he was a good guy. He loved the Lord. He and many other folks thought that was Noah's Ark. They did a lot of studies on that. They didn't think that's the Ark. They say it collapsed on itself, folded out to the side with ground-penetrating radar. They found what they said were deck timbers in there. They found iron rivets and bolted this thing together. They've got some in the museum south of Nashville. I've held the rivets in my hand. Go to the Cornersville, Tennessee, and you get off the interstate, there's an old abandoned gas station that they've converted, converted a gas station right there into the museum about Noah's Ark. The government of Turkey said, yep, that's Noah's Ark down in the valley. They built a visitor center. Now there have been some creationist organizations that say, no, it's not Noah's Ark, and we don't like you because you've been saying it might be. Okay, I'm sorry, you know. If I ever start working for you, I'll do what you say. But meanwhile, I'm going to tell folks I think it's a possibility that it could be Noah's Ark. The Bible says the Ark will be 300 cubits long. Now, a cubit, cubit is elbow to fingertip. I'm 6'1", six six one, my cubit is 21, 21 inches. The standard Hebrew cubit was 18 inches. inches. The standard Egyptian cubit is 20.6. 20. That boat-shaped object is 20.6 20. 20. inches times 300, or 515 feet long. Hmm. So that doesn't prove it's Noah's Ark, but it could be. It's in the right place, it's about the right shape, and it's about the right length. It's about two-thirds the size of the Titanic. Makes it about almost two football fields long. Pretty good size boat. In, in that, that region, region, they found 12 big rocks that weigh about 9,000 pounds apiece. These rocks have holes in the top. Apparently, that hole was feet, 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 not yards. I was wrong. And this right. rock was held over the side of the boat. 10 or 12, or who knows how many they found 12. Could have been more. That's called a drone stone. If you hang a bunch of rocks all around the boat, the boat becomes more stable during stormy weather. It's like a whole bunch of shock absorbers to keep the boat flat, you know, keep your platform flat. If it really gets windy, They'll drag behind you, and it turns the boat perpendicular to the waves. Now you can't roll over capsize. That's real dangerous in high seas. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hoven, I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having rocks hanging all over the side. He said, you are so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? <laughs> I wrote back and said, where was he going? <laughs> He's, He's not, not trying, trying to go, go anywhere. He's just trying to float. <laughs> and I'm stupid, yeah. yeah. I debated a former preacher turned atheist. Mm. And he, he said, you can't, you can't build a boat more than 300 feet long because it'll break on over the waves. He said, they built a ship one time that had six masts, you know, a six master. And the, you know, the tw twist of the boat so bad it leaked all the time. They finally had to give it up. Noah's Ark didn't have any masts. Hello. It's designed to float, not to sail. All right. Probably, Probably a big, big barge, barge of some kind. I don't know. know. He, he said, said boat, you know, when the waves come up, it bends and breaks in the middle. Well, a lot of boats over 300 feet long have been built out of wood and survived. The Chinese had some really big ones many years ago out of wood. Plus, if you put a moon pool in the boat, that solves the problem. A moon pool is a hole in the floor with walls up on the inside, of course, so the boat doesn't sink. And as, the, as you go over the waves, this relieves the stress. Now the water com actually comes up inside the boat partway. A moon pool is a pretty cool idea. As the water goes up and down in that hole, it would be relieving the stress. Good, great place to dump your garbage, too, by the way, inside the boat, out of the rain. Thirdly, it acts like a giant piston to pump fresh air in and out of the boat every time you hit a wave. It's a cool thing, cool theory. Uh, remember what he had in the basement? You might pray for a good wave once in a while.
I think it's probably true. Yeah. You just shovel all the manure so right anyway, into that hole. Anyway, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, what happened to them? If the Bible story is true, as I say that it is, Noah had to have dinosaurs on the ark. So what happened to them? What made the dinosaurs? That ark museum I was telling you about in Kentucky, too. Like, they show, like, how uh, the family of eight could have easily fed and watered everything every day. Just simple chores. Um, it's really, really cool. You should check it out. Um, they probably differ... As a matter of fact, I think I'm, I'm almost positive that they differ from Dr. Hoven in some of the theories, and that's fine. On on some of the like the moon pool, we don't know that for sure. The canopy above the Earth, we don't know if that was ice. Those are good theories. They're logical theories. They make sense. Um, we can't be dogmatic about it, but um, so it's fine to differ on some of those things. But uh, check out the Ark Museum. It's very very cool. Of course, go extinct. That's a question they're always asking the kids in school. There are at least 16 theories floating around the textbooks. They'll say, kids, maybe a meteor struck the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago. Well, another guy from Indiana's got a cool theory. He says the dinosaurs killed themselves off with their own flatulence. He said they couldn't stand the heat. I don't know what to do about a theory like that, but uh, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Hey, uh, they're asking the wrong question. The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? You know, the liberals are really good at getting us to argue about the wrong topic. They're always asking me, should we teach creation in public schools? I said, that's a good question, and I will be glad to discuss it. However, there's another question we need to ask first. Should there be public schools? Should we schools? have public schools? Yeah. yeah, let's ask that one first. I praise God for the good, godly public school teachers. My mother was a public school teacher and retired. My brother's in his 34th year teaching public school. He led me to the Lord. There are many good, godly public school teachers, okay? But folks, the, work, the books they work from, the curriculum, is corrupt. Unfixable, I think. If you, if you love your kids and you possibly can, get them out. I don't think it's fixable. Amen. Praise God for the good teachers who are going to slug it out in there, and I'm for you, and I want to help. Okay, but I don't think it's fixable. Bottom line. If you want to find out why we have a public school system, our Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says the federal government's got no business being involved in education. But we've got a public school system as part of a bigger, long-range plan toward a new world order. Yeah. That's Karl Marx's idea, Communist Manifesto Plank Number 10, free public education. We'll cover more on that on uh, Seminar Part 5 and also on our college class, CSE 102. You don't want to watch that one. That's politically incorrect. Anyway. When the dinosaurs got off the ark, they faced a very hostile climate. Things had changed. Remember, before the flood, they lived over 900 years. After the flood, only 400, and then 200, and then 100. Something changed after the flood, folks. The canopy of water that used to protect them was gone. And you're not going to make it to 100, or 200 for sure. You might make it to 100, but you won't make it to 200. Not in this world. Dinosaurs had two serious problems after the flood. Number one, the climate was a lot different. They just couldn't live long enough to get big enough to reproduce in many cases. So some species probably went extinct in the first few generations. Second problem, I think, was worse. People hunted them. Back in those days, they called them dragons. They didn't call them dinosaur because the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. No. So for most of human history, they called them dragons. Dragons are mentioned in the Bible 35 times. And as the population began to grow after the flood, the population of dragons began to go down because nobody wants to live next door to a dragon. The same thing happened right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. How many grizzly bears are roaming loose in the woods in this county right here? Zero, right? How many grizzly bears were roaming around Milwaukee area 500 years ago? Probably a whole bunch of them. Well, what happened? As people move in and civilize an area, the big, the big creatures, or ferocious creatures, are driven off or killed off. Happens all the time. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Milwaukee, Wisconsin, do you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? Every redneck in four counties would be out with a rifle trying to shoot them. <laughs> right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They put his picture in the paper. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. <laughs> that's exactly what would happen. Well, that's what happened to the dragons. 
Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, you'd be a hero. They'd tell stories about you around the campfire for generations to come. And there are thousands of stories of people killing dragons. They killed them off for meat. There'd be a lot of hamburger and one brachiosaurus. They killed them for medicine. It's amazing how many ancient recipes call for dragon bones to be ground up and put in with the medicine. Lots of legends tell of people killing dragons. Gilgamesh supposedly slew a dragon. A Chinese guy named Yu slew dragons that were bothering them as they tried to expand the territory and drain off the swamps and make the land of China livable again. And to drive off the snakes and dragons. The Babylonian god Marduk is shown pictured on top of a dragon. Possibly a fire-breathing dragon. You say, oh, you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Oh, yeah. The Bible talks about a fly fiery flying serpent. The book of Job has a whole chapter, Job 41, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. It says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. <laughs> As out of a seething pot or cauldron, his breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. There really was a fire-breathing dragon. In our green series of tapes, the topical ones, we've got a whole tape out there, hour and a half, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. If you get a Catholic Bible, There's some actually like Daniel, pretty good science on Daniel how that would happen. It's part of the Apocrypha it's pretty interesting. It shouldn't be in Scripture. It's interesting reading, but it's not part of Scripture. It says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him, therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, it means give me permission, O king, and I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation of what's going on here. The Bible tells us Daniel was a man who understood science. He knew full well that pitch is made from tree sap and it's very sticky. They used to have whole industries in America just making pitch to use to uh, waterproof ships. They would coat them with pitch made from tree sap, particularly pine. And fat is very salty tasting and just about all animals like salty tasting things. The, the hunters put out salt licks for the deer, right, or cat, cattle have like salt licks. And hair won't digest. He mixed them all together tossed them in, the dragon liked the taste, swallowed them, but they wouldn't digest. And these were the days before Ruder Ruder, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. You figure it out. Anyway, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Hussein, thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. The guy has a serious ego problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar brought back to life. By the way, you ever notice George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein? There's a reason for that. I've been told, anyway, the word Saddam means prince. Saddam, spelled the same way, means horses rear end. <laughs> but Saddam thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. He's got his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar on their currency over there, their gold coins. He spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. Did you know ancient Babylon has been rebuilt? They always knew where the city was. It was destroyed about 600 B.C. But when Babylon was, they, you know, just buried in the sand, forget about it, they dug it out, and the sand had really preserved the bricks extremely well. The old brick walls of the ancient city of Babylon were very well preserved in the dry sand over there, and they found carvings of lions and carvings of dragons. How did they know about dragons in 600 B.C.? Well, that had been almost 2,000 years since the flood, so from the flood up until, you know, Nebuchadnezzar reigned, it was 1,800 years. Probably most dinosaurs were gone by then, but I think a few were still around. And he had one in a cage, apparently. In 300 B.C., Alexander the Great reported his soldiers were scared by dragons when they conquered part of India. This Roman mosaic was made in the second century after Christ. It shows two long-necked dragons fighting or kissing. Boy, that would be necking, wouldn't it? Wow. Uh, anyway, how did the Romans know about dragons in the second century after Christ? St. George is famous for slaying dragons in 275 A.D. He finally got killed because he was a Christian. Beowulf slew dragons. You ought to try to read the Beowulf story in Old English. We sell the book only because it's such interesting reading. 
The old English is, I think, impossible to read. That's English, folks, from 1,500 years ago. Our language has changed a little bit, okay? Probably the peak of the English language was about 400 years ago when Shakespeare and God chose to use the King James and all that stuff about that time, about the peak of the English language. But the Beowulf story says Beowulf killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off one of its arms and the creature bled to death. Strange story. You know, they found a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a guy pulling the arm off a dragon. Hmm. There are dragon legends from countries all over the world. Ancient pottery, like this one, probably one of the oldest pieces of pottery on planet Earth, from the eight, uh, first dynasty of Egypt, shows two long-necked dragons. Looks like dinosaurs to me. You see what all this is showing? Like, the evolutionists want you to believe that dinosaurs died off before man ever appeared. Well, obviously, man saw dinosaurs. How else would they know to create these artworks? All across the world, same thing. How would they know unless they had seen? Like, we know now because we dig up the bones and we can put it together, and that's, we know, but how did they know? They obviously had to have seen it. Here's another one showing two long necked dinosaurs holding a sheet between their mouths. Between their mouths. This hippo tusk was found in an ancient Egyptian tomb from the 12th century BC. Shows an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Why would there be dragon legends from countries all over the world? Thailand has many legends of the dragon. China, of course, is famous for its dragon legends. The uh, gargoyle that you see on the corners of the buildings in Europe, you know, apparently came from the story of a gargoyle, uh, they called it a dragon, that came up out of the water in France. That's where the gargoyle legend comes from. There's a Russian medallion that shows a man killing a dragon. This Bulgarian postage stamp shows a guy killing a dragon. An Irish writer said they killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Well, it, Stegosaurus had awful big spikes on his tail. We've got a copy of one in our museum there. And there are dragon heads found on the ships that the Vikings used to sail around. There's a Viking uh, woodcut showing a dragon swallowing a man. Taken from a book called Vikings by Tony Allen. 11th century picture. That's just 900 years ago. They were still talking about pe dragons swallowing people. The Vikings put dragon heads on their ships. Interesting. Get the book After the Flood by Bill Cooper. Excellent book about what happened to Noah's sons and how they spread out, if you like, the genealogy type stuff. He's really one to read brilliant that. at that. But he mentions many of these ancient people talking about having to fight dragons. You can get that book from our ministry or on our website, drdino.com. Siegfried, the famous Norwegian hero, slew the dragon Fafner about a thousand years ago. Marco Polo lived in China about 800 years ago, 750 years ago, and said the emperor in China was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Why would he come back and tell a story like that? Well, I think it's because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. That's, that's my theory, <laughs> why he said that. Did you know in 1611, the old Chinese law books tell about they appointed the post of royal dragon feeder? Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Mm, let me guess, uh, to feed the dragon. Yeah, right. A city in France was renamed Nurluk to honor the man who slew the dragon. The Indians used to carve pictures on the cliffs of Grand Canyon and all the canyons out there. One of the pictures they found shows a dinosaur. Now, how did the Indians know about dinosaurs to carve their pictures on the walls of the Grand Canyon? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they hunted dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. In 1925, some scientists went down one of the canyons out west, just exploring that region, and here's what they wrote. The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories. Oh, you poor fella. They upset his theories. Mm. He said, facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, the theories must change. The facts remain. I agree. That's the way science is supposed to work. You can have any theory you want, but if the facts don't square with your theory, throw your theory away. Hey Amen. Think about that. We theorize, this is what the evolutionists say, we theorize that m millions of years before man even existed, the dinosaurs went extinct. They were gone. That's our theory. Dinosaurs were here before men. Okay, now we find all these drawings from ancient cultures and, and sculptures and, 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 and vases or, or vases, however you want to say that. Uh, we find these with dinosaurs all over them. Obviously, our theory's wrong. Obviously, these people saw dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived with man. 
theory's gone. Here's the facts. They would have thrown out evolution a long time ago, except they don't have a replacement theory other than, you know, maybe creation. He goes on and he says, about a year ago, a photograph of a dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. He said, it's not a dinosaur, it's impossible. Because we know dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on Earth. I want you to notice, he said, dinosaurs went extinct 12 million years. Right? Today they tell the kids, 65 million years. I've been studying the inflation of the age of the Earth. Did you know in 1770, the textbooks say the Earth was 70,000 years old? Some of them do. You go to 1905 textbooks, they say the Earth is 2 billion years old. In 1969, the textbooks say the Earth is 3.5 billion years old. Today it says 4.6 billion. Did you know the Earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? That's 40 years per minute. Mm -hmm. Aging rapidly, folks. Go to Blanding, Utah, and you can see carvings of dinosaurs on the cliffs there. There's a painting found in Australia uh, by an aboriginal showing a native running away from a long-necked, round-bodied animal, probably a dinosaur. I can't pronounce the name of this place in Canada, Misha something or other, but it looks like somebody drew a dinosaur on the cliff up there. The Indians talked about the great animal that lived in the lake out there. This guy says nobody's ever seen one. He doesn't know that. If nobody's ever seen one, why did they carve them on the cliffs? Mm -hmm. Down in Inca, Peru, they've got the driest desert in the world down there. The Spanish came across there and saw white lines across the desert. Nobody could figure out what those white lines were until they got airplanes. That was crazy. And realized these are actually giant images. One of the images shows a spider that looks really strange. One of the legs is longer Sticking out to the side like that. Dude, when you look into this, this is mind blowing. I don't know how these ancient, I don't know what you call them, our South American natives called, do we call them Indians? It's such a, that's not the term. These natives from South America, look at the detail on that spider, man. And like when you research this, it's crazy. There are these huge things in the sand that you couldn't have done without an aerial view. Like how. It's pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> and for years, everybody thought, well, these guys were just making up these stories. They're just, you know, it's imagination. They just discovered here recently there's a little tiny spider that lives in the desert. It's extremely rare. Most folks have never seen it, never heard of it. It's only about an eighth of an inch long, this spider. During mating season, that leg grows longer, and that's how they mate with the next spider. Then it goes back in. How, they had to have magnifying glasses to even know that. And here they are carving them huge images out in their desert. Either these guys had incredible eyesight, or they knew about how to do magnify things somehow. Long get Dennis Swift's book on that. He's got a lot of good stuff on this images down in Nazca. But in, 17, in 1571, the Spanish came across there, and they found rocks with strange animals on them. They were carved in these rocks. They brought some back to the king of Spain and said, what are these? He said, I don't know. I've never seen an animal like that. Today, they're called the Nazca burial stones. There are about 20 of these in America. We have three in our museum in Pensacola. The largest collection, I think, second largest collection in America, three. <clears throat> Some of them show brain surgery. Some of them show replacing artificial, putting artificial lens on crazy. people. One of them shows what appears to be a steam engine. These are from 2,000 years ago when these things were carved on there. About 500 of the stones show dinosaurs with people. Crystal now, clear would images there be dinosaurs of dinosaurs and people too. carved together on these stones 2,000 years ago. Look at that. Just about every known dinosaur Look at the triceratops. Pictured on these things, including many Stegosaurus. We could spend hours talking. We'll talk more about these stones on our college class. Uh, Obviously, they but saw these things. This one shows Dennis Swift has this one. He shows uh, circles on the side of the dinosaur. Here's one from my museum. Shows a dinosaur holding a guy by the head. Here's another one I've got in our museum. Shows a dinosaur with had his head cut off. Apparently, this guy has a knife in his hand. Cut the dinosaur's head off because the dinosaur killed his friend. That's, we think that's what the story's telling. Taking vengeance is what the Bible says. You know, vengeance is fine, saith the Lord. No. Something like that. I forget how it was exactly, but that's close enough. <laughs> now, why would they put dinosaurs on these stones? And why put the circles on the side? Now, that's really interesting. You know, if you found dinosaur bones, that would not give you a clue what the skin looked like. Here's these stones from 2,000 years ago, showing circles on the side. 
You know, they found fossilized dinosaur skin about 12 years ago, and it had uh, circle patterns on it. Hmm. The fossilized dinosaur skin shows circle patterns. It looks to me like they must have seen a live one to know how to do that. This one shows a guy cutting the head off of one. There's a guy riding a dinosaur of some kind. They found pottery in one of the uh, graves down there. It looked like a dinosaur. Where's the bell to anybody else? There could be a dinosaur on this pottery. The mummy in the grave was wrapped up in a blanket, and it had dinosaurs embroidered into the blanket. Why would they put dinosaurs on their blankets and on their pottery? And carve them on cliff walls. You go to Acumburo, Mexico, and they found 56,000 ceramic figurines of dinosaurs as they dug to put in a basement of this one house. So wait a minute, what? Somebody stored a cache of dinosaurs. Thousands and thousands of them. We could spend many days talking about this, but lots more on that on seminar part two of our series. We cover more on dinosaurs and Ica stuff. This guy says nobody's ever seen one. I'm sorry, he does not know that. An Italian fella, 400 years ago, was out walking his cows, taking care of his cows, and a, apparently a dinosaur scared his cows, and he hit the thing on the back of the neck and broke its neck with his walking stick. They had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display, probably in Tanistrophius. Uh, by the way, do you, know, do you know why so many Italians are named Tony? Years ago, they were shipping a bunch of them to America, and they stamped on their forehead, to New York. Figured. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Always Many people think the second jokes. artifact appears to be like a pterodactyl with its wings folded against its body. Another dinosaur. The Romans came across to America long before Columbus did. One of the Roman swords found in Arizona shows a dinosaur on it. I called the guy who's got the sword. I said, uh, Tom, what do you think about this uh, sword? He said, well, it has to be fake because we know man and dinosaurs did not live at the same time. Mm. Oh, do you know that or do you think that? And kids, if you ever get taught that Columbus was the first white man across the ocean, you are mistaken. They are mistaken, okay? Brendan the Navigator came over here in 500 AD. The Romans came back and forth. Apparently, King Solomon made his ships go back and forth across the ocean to America. There's lots of evidence of trade back and forth long before the Dark Ages shut all that stuff down, apparently. But during the recent age of sailing ships, after the Dark Ages was over, there were many reports during that 400-year span of sightings of sea monsters. Many, many legends of sea monsters exist. I have read so many stories, we can talk for hours on this, I won't, but I've read, I'm sure, 300 books just on sea monster sightings, ancient ships, log books, stuff like that. It's incredible how many sightings of sea monsters are recorded in ancient books. Captain McKay said his crew saw a sea monster 60 feet long swim under their boat. The whaling ship Monongahela actually killed a 103-foot sea monster. They measured it. They were cutting it up, and another, another ship said, what are you guys doing? They said, we just killed a sea monster. Amazing story to read the whole story about the Monongahela. The sea monster knocked the captain out of the small boat that went out there to harpoon it. Sailors had to rescue him. He was unconscious. This thing had a huge head. They cut the thing up, put the bones in the boat. The other ship bought the oil, sea serpent oil, and went back and told the story. Said, man, the Monongahela is coming in a few months, and they're going to show you guys the bones of the sea serpent. Well, the Monongahela sailed on and was never heard from again. Hmm. Apparently, it sank in a storm. So I'm sure some old sailors, sailors got laughed at for claiming they saw sea monsters. One of the guys who later rescued the folks on the Titanic was Captain Roston, Arthur Henry Roston. In 1907, he saw off the coast of Ireland as a sea monster. He sketched pictures of it. He said it was a sea serpent. Now, notice what this author of this book says. This book is called Titanic, Triumph and Tragedy. The author says, however imaginative the young officer may have been, uh, excuse me, do you see any prejudice in that statement? In other words, he thinks he saw a sea monster, but I know better because, you know, he was there and I wasn't. <laughs> One German submarine commander said that when they sank a British ship during World War I, what appeared to be a giant sea monster came flying up out of the water, 60 feet long, four big flippers. There are stories of giant octopus pulling ships underwater. You say, come on, an octopus never get that big. Oh, it didn't get pretty big. This one washed up on the beach in Florida, St. Augustine, about 100 years ago. The octopus was 200 feet across and weighed five tons. All right, we're going to stop there. All right, so a lot of good information there. Um, probably got about two more uh, videos until we get through um, this third disc. 
Uh, but but pretty interesting. I mean, it's it's crystal clear from the evidence that dinosaurs and man lived together. You you just you can't get around that fact. There's artifacts. There's drawings. There's sketches. There's 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 just in so much evidence uh, of of ancient cultures drawing dinosaurs. How could they know that unless they saw dinosaurs? Um, and then you know all the dragon stories, the flood stories. They have um, a connection in reality. You know, the, 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 all these different myths from these different cultures obviously began with a single story, with a single historical account. Um, so it's, it's just crystal clear evidence. You, you can't get around it. And the evolutionary theory um, hides this information from people, uh, tries to get around it. Like, I never heard about this stuff when I was uh, growing up, when I, when I was being taught this stuff in school. Um, you know, or on TV when you're learning about dinosaurs or, or at museums, you never hear about these drawings and these sketches and these artifacts uh, with the dinosaurs, and and you never hear about the connection between dragons and dinosaurs. Even though, like we intuitively, I, I remember growing up, like in the back of your head, you're like, man, you know, dragons and dinosaurs are awfully similar. They must be referring to the same thing. But, uh, anyways, uh, that's what we got here tonight. And uh, uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll pick up next week. Um, so I appreciate you guys watching with me. I love you, and we'll talk to you next time.